I'll just make your presenter, ma'am. Can you please try, ma'am? Yes, yes. I have unmuted Great. now because it said only the organizers can unmute. <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. It's fine. Now you, we can hear you very well. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll hand over the session to Professor Joseph Ponaya to start with the introduction of the speaker. Over to you, sir. We are delighted. <coughs> we are delighted to have uh, uh, Ms. Geeta, uh, Geeta Hariharan as the speaker for the session. Um, she will be delivering on uh, writing the world translation as the writer's uh, metaphor. Geeta Hariharan has written novels, short fiction and essays over the last three decades. Her highly acclaimed work includes The Thousand Faces of Night, which won the Commonwealth Writers Prize for a best first book in 1993. The short story collection, The Art of Dying, the novels, The Ghost of Vasu Master, When Dreams Travel in Times of Seas and Fugitive Histories, and a collection of essays entitled Almost Home, Cities and Other Places. She has also written children's stories and edited a collection of uh, translated a short fiction, a Southern Harvest, the essay collection from India to Palestine, essays in solidarity, and she has co-edited Battling for India as Citizens as Reader. She has over the years been a cultural commentator through her essays, lectures, and activism. In 1995, she challenged the Hindu minority and the guardianship act as discriminatory against women. The case Geeta Hariharan and another versus Reserve Bank of India and another led to a landmark Supreme Court judgment in 1999 on guardianship. So we welcome you to uh, our workshop, Madam. And now we are delighted to have uh, um, Geeta Hari, Ms. Geeta Hariharan as the speaker for the session. So over to you, Madam. Thank you so much. Um, I, of course, uh, feel a little as if I'm here under false pretenses because I'm not, um, strictly speaking, uh, a, a translator. But uh, not only am I extremely interested in the uh, literal process of translation, the craft of translation, but I'm also interested in the what I call the long view of translation, which is um, both in terms of our practice of putting our thoughts and ideas and feelings and everything that we are full of into language, uh, 
as as a writer, but really also as a citizen. So um, this calls, of course, for uh, a context, a context of location. And this is what I'm hoping to lead uh, some of my remarks uh, towards. What kind of uh, context are we talking about uh, within which we practice translation on a day to day basis uh, in our lives? But also, what specifically do uh, writers and by extension readers do uh, as they partake of translation? So I'm going to talk about first the extremely complex relationship that we have with language. So forgive me if I seem to go down to the basics to begin with. Um, as a writer, the uh, simple but not necessarily simplistic uh, aspects of our practice is what interests me. So I want to start off with um, with a, a, a personal uh, encounter with with language uh, to build up to the context. So I'm going to uh, read a little bit from uh, my book uh, Almost Home. And till the age of eight, I was called P.H. Gita and I studied in a school in which the medium of instruction was Tamil. My initials were very confident about where I came from. P for Perungulam, literally Big Pond, was the village in Palakkad my father came from. Palgat used to be Palakkad and has now gone back to being so thanks to post-colonial corrective zeal. H for Hariharan was the paterfamilias himself. My name mapped me geographically and patrilineally. It told the world I was Perungulam Hariharan's Gita. More important, it told me who I was, where I came from, even what my place in the world was. We didn't live in Palakkad though. We lived in Matunga, the South Indian stronghold of Bombay. In Matunga, you could live a lifetime and lose little of your linguistic, culinary and other assorted legacies to the host city. Then my father, a journalist, became the founder editor of a newspaper, The Economic Times, and we moved from Matunga to Napinsi Road, not more than 10 or 12 kilometers from South Indian School. In Napinsi Road, a new world populated by Hindi, Marathi and Gujarati speakers, all of them ruled by Indian English, unfolded for my bewilderment and delight. My sister and I practiced what we imagined was English. This English was a guttural vowel hating language. It made us happy because no one but the two of us understood it. But when we were sent to our new school, we discovered that the rest of the world, a place full of perverse people, spoke in English much less exciting and much more exacting than ours. In my first week in the new school, an English speaking little ogre, the class monitor, and a boy several times my size, said to me, your name is PH, so your father's name must be Gita. I did not need English or his smirk to understand that my stern, all-knowing father was being reduced to a mere girl. My old self was due for a change. I was sent home with a note from my teacher demanding a surname. Since we had no such thing, only the village initial and, my, and the father initial, my mother wrote my father's single name on a piece of paper, Hari Haran. I was born again, this time without initials. My father was still there, but as a last name. I was no longer his alone. As for Perungulam, the ancestral village, I lost it entirely. Tamil too was soon to be endangered, at least outside the home. It occurs to me now that neither my parents nor my teachers were perturbed that I did not know a word of English. Apparently, they knew something that I didn't, because not long after I acquired a surname, the English followed quite meekly. In a year's time, I had learned the language that went with my new cosmopolitan name, which would make it easier to fill out international application forms that took you places. 
the kind that begin first name, family name. I was not to know till many years later that I had been selected to become one of Macaulay's step illegitimate great grandchildren. So, you know, I um, as, a, as, as a child um, and I know that this experience of mine is not unique. Um, because uh, we live in a multilingual context and many of us have um, for historical reasons, for locational reasons, for your parents' livelihood reasons, we have been pushed to different places and uh, what we have then is um, a, a kind of kitchen of languages. I do remember that uh, when the census uh, takers uh, came to my house once. Um, they were completely puzzled because we claimed that um, uh, the uh, father in the household. First, we had an argument about who they would put down as head of household, but um, since they didn't believe in co-heads of uh, household in the census, but they were extremely puzzled when we all claimed to have different mother tongues. And uh, uh, as, as Delhiites, if there is anybody who will confess to being a Delhiite in India, um, a rather shameful thing in many ways, uh, my children, we said, um, you know, their mother tongue is English. And the census chap looked at us with great disgust, went out and probably wrote exactly what he thought we should be. So what I'm trying to say is that um, very early on, you realize uh, several things about language. One is that it is slippery. One is that you can be in various locations in terms of being an insider or an outsider. And um, uh, though it might seem self-indulgent that I began with this little autobiographical account, I want to point out, especially for the young ones, that you must pay attention to the signals here, the signposts of hybridity. So when I say Palakkad, but I'm talking about Tamil, already you know that you don't belong either to a straightforward uh, a language family as in Tamil or a straightforward language family as in Malayalam. So already you are a hybrid, um, which hold on to that thought, because what does hybridity mean? What does being on the border mean? You know, uh, what does uh, being a straddler mean? Um, so that is there. And then you have Bombay and within Bombay, just 11 kilometers apart. Uh, I remember always sort of worrying about this because people would say they went off to Canada or the United States or somewhere and they felt dislocated. And here we were, uh, we moved 11 kilometers and we not only really changed languages, but I um, want to underline the fact that shifts in language mean shifts in subcultures as well as cultures. So um, things are not what they seem. Uh, you know, you are going to stand um, as a 13 year old in Bombay, my Bombay, not Mumbai. We stood pretty much at the center of Indian English with all its uh, angularities, its uh, associations of power, uh, but and its dangers of deracination and loss of multilingual practice, but with multiple languages leaking into your day-to-day uh, -day experience. But we also stood at the doorstep of Hindi as national language and hold that thought again about the national. Marathi as a state language, Gujarati as the alternative state language, and Palakkad Ayer Tamil spoken at home. And then for a reason I will never fathom, French, which I discovered years later, did not work all that well in France. But to come back to Hindi, I moved to Delhi at the age of 30, and I assumed that I was a Hindi speaker and discovered that actually I spoke not hybrid, but an impure bhasha called Bambaya. So in addition to 
multilingual. In addition to hybridity, please add should and ashud. I am definitely in the hybrid and impure camp. Now, this is very important because this determines the kind of writer you will be. You know, the, the literal process of translation that a multilingual um, writer and reader goes through and the metaphorical process of translation you go through because almost always, 99.9% .9 of the time, you are writing about people who are not thinking in English, who are not speaking in English. So what, what is this bizarre kind of process, what I think of as invisible translation? So I have already told you that um, you have an exciting week ahead because this is a, we have a very complex relationship with language languages. It's on the one hand, it's vexed in terms of levels of competence, in terms of difficulties of craft in finding equivalences, just in terms of words, but sensibility. But you also have power structures uh, in, in, in terms of uh, whether it's English, whether it's Hindi, there are different sorts of power structures. Uh, there are also political problems, which I will uh, come to by and by. Um, uh, it, it's very difficult to leave uh, politics out of all discussion of um, uh, translation, of literature, of languages, um, power structures being, you know, important. But to begin with, I'm going to actually do something rather straightforward before I get back to complexities, which is talk about the most obvious merit of translation, which we sometimes forget when we are talking about the craft of translation. Uh, in India in particular, uh, we tend to sort of, uh, uh, you know, get very snobbish about a particular language and say, you will never find the equivalent uh, for this, this word. So what do we do? Do we give up or do we make use of this miracle of translation. If reading is a miracle, if writing is a miracle, so is translation. It is a miracle. Um, and so I'm going to again read a little bit. I promise this is the last thing I'm going to read. Um, it's from an essay called Speaking in Haiku. And it was about my experience in Japan when I did not have the language. And you suddenly realize that without the bridge of translation, we are nothing. So the multilingual mess of a Bombay childhood should have prepared me better for the tricks language plays on travelers, both at home and elsewhere. But only now, all these years later, I felt with full force the impossibility of living in a world without translation. Received wisdom has any number of gloomy precepts about the loss of translation, that it is merely an echo that the best part is lost in translation. In India in particular, given the vexed relationship between English and the other Indian languages, many people like to insist that an English equivalent can never be found for this or that word in Marathi or Kannada or Bengali. Happily, there are the imaginative takes on translation as well, not only on its necessity and the wonderful accidents it sometimes leads to, but on the fundamental relationship between original and translation as being somewhat akin to the relationship between dream and waking life. The expert on all such convoluted matters, Borges, said the original is unfaithful to the translation. I liked this when I was in Japan. I liked thinking that if I looked through the window pane of translation, I could see that the boundaries were not rigid, that knowledge and idea and beauty did not have a home anywhere in particular, not even, quote unquote, the West. It helped me see the ways in which science and ideas, story and food 
travel to make knowledge and culture at various intersections in India or Egypt or Iraq or the Mediterranean or Greece or Spain. The petty details of real life travel in our times do not always let us see translation at its most harrowing, though. I wondered if we should give up our little word and phrase guidebooks. Perhaps the haiku with its impressionistic exchanges is the best mode of speech when you need to acknowledge both happy and unhappy accidents of translation. Then I recalled Bel Canto, a novel I'd read by the American writer Anne Patchett. The novel seemed to belong here in this moment in the cool gray Japanese evening by the sea. The story of Bel Canto in bald form, a poor unnamed country in South America holds a birthday party for a Japanese company man hoping to improve trade opportunities. Katsumi Hosokawa is the chairman of a large electronics company in Japan. He's also an ardent lover of opera. Though he's never set eyes on Roxanne, an American soprano, he's in love with her voice. Roxanne is invited to perform at the party and Hosokawa arrives with his translator, Jen Watanabe. The party is at the home of the vice president of the country. The president skips the party because it clashes with his favorite soap on TV. A terrorist group expecting the president to be there storms the party. They decide to take the guests, or at least the important ones, hostage. All kinds of demands are made. The government cannot meet them, and there is a standoff. A strange limbo-like time, an almost utopia in which anything seems possible, even people talking to each other. Though a bloody confrontation waits like an inevitable end, there is the time in the house with people from different places speaking different languages, learning to speak to each other. Romance stirs despite impediments. Love blooms. The love between Hosokawa and Roxanne can only be called open-ended since neither speaks the other's language. But languages are learned, including the language of music. Music, it turns out, is the most powerful language of all. The singing voice is able to evoke the most human responses, harmony, compassion, a sense of what really matters, a sense of difference and sameness coexisting in real life. The most powerful insight of the novel is that for all kinds of people to survive together, the one indispensable person is the translator. Everyone needs him to interpret for them. And the translator, a soft-spoken young man, usually on the edge of all groups and events, finds himself at the heart of the unfolding situation in the strange community. Without him, Osokawa cannot express his love for Roxanne. The young terrorist Carmen cannot learn to read, write or laugh, and the others cannot understand life and death instructions. The story is located in a setting increasingly familiar to even the most cushioned people. Troubled places. Places which become troubled places when and where you least expect it. Troubled places tend to be multilingual, literally and metaphorically. In a situation where you have to understand to survive, or in a situation when you have to be understood and counted as a communicating human, the translator is the hero. So there is more than one way in which language makes a home. So I want to begin my long view of translation as literal practice as well as metaphorical practice with this thought that the translator is the real hero of our times, not only in the world at large, but in our own multilingual country. So I uh, want now to, to uh, move to, to the authorities. And for me, in addition to Borges's uh, quirky definition, uh, my own personal guru for writing and matters of um, translation has been A.K. Ramanujan, who I'm sure will come up uh, several times in the course of the next few days. And when he was 
uh, reflecting on translation, specifically in the context of poetry. He describes it as a multidimensional process in which the translator has to deal with her material, her means, her resources and object objectives, all at several levels and simultaneously. So I that takes me to the to the kind of uh, complex, to the syndrome of points that I want to make, that by multidimensional, I'm going to say multilingualism. And multidimensional, multilingualism, really it means writing and speaking diversity, writing and speaking multiple identities, hybridity, and then multiple registers within a language, reflective both of divisions as well as crossing or vaulting over borders. Now, what do I mean by this? I, I, I want to pause here and talk about these multiple registers. Uh, the translators uh, over the next few days, I am sure, will speak more knowledgeably about this. But I know, for example, that um, when I was editing A Southern Harvest, which is a collection of um, translations into English from the four major South Indian languages, we say four major South Indian languages, but of course we know that each of our languages has sort of, I don't know, I'm using the word registers perhaps wrongly, but it has subcultures depending on uh, geographical location, depending on caste, and this is uh, uh, and and this is very very important to say because um, we have examples in real life. My friend Bama uh, uh, has told me about how when she wrote her autobiographical first book Karak, that people in the in her village were quite angry with her initially, and they said that as it is, um, you know, they think of us, our community as ugly, and now you have actually revealed to them the language, the earthy language in which we speak. And it took a while, it took a while for the people in the village to realize with a lot of the young Ambedkarites in the village, explaining to them that this is what we are and we have to be proud of our language. And who's anyone to say this is not literary or this is not powerful or beautiful. So you have within a, a language, within Tamil or Telugu, uh, these locations, geographical locations, you might be in the border, you might be from uh, the Muslim community, or you might be from a Dalit background. So the multiplicities of languages, there is also, it's not always just pride, there is also the collisions that take place. So that you might have, um, there are some very moving Dalit poems when uh, the poet asks, what language should I write in? Do I write in the acceptable um, uh, uh, language of the establishment of the literary orthodoxy, uh, which would want me to partake of Brahminical uh, rules for language? Or do I write in the language that I've heard at home? Do I write in the language of my father? Can go a little further, even though he belongs to a particular caste? or of my mother, who has even less space, you know? So these are the kind of collisions you have. And in other words, we are not going to pretend it's, it's, it's a kind of, what shall I say, sweetness and light kind of scene. It is not. Language, and we're not going to pretend that it's only the conflict between um, English and the multiple Englishes we speak in India, and the other Indian languages. It's not. We have uh, a very long history of power structures, uh, you know, within language, but we also have a long experience of languages. Languages and cultures really don't care about borders. And this is terribly important for us to remember. 
because borders have actually yielded very rich hybrid languages. Think of Marathi and uh, Kannada flowing into each other. Um, think of uh, Tamil and Malayalam flowing into each other. Um, and most important, think of the power of the bilingual. Think of the power of the multilingual. And we need to think of this because we do not we do not want to equate a language with a religion. There is no such thing. So we do not, we want to claim Urdu as part of our very, very rich storehouse of languages. And there is, it cannot be mapped. And I think this is really important because this powerful treasure chest that we have of multiple languages must be used for its bewildering riches, not seen as a problem. So I get to my own experience of invisible translation. So this is in a sense, as I said, there is this very complex business of location. You might be located in a particular way because you're a woman or you belong to a, the working class or you belong to a particular caste, or you're an Adivasi, or you're a Muslim. But, um, and I must point out that this is not just marginal positions. I remember Krishna Sopti, uh, the wonderful um, Punjabi writer, telling me that, um, and of course, as, as a Tamil, I enjoyed this very much. She said, you know, Punjabi is very earthy, and Urdu is also important, and Hindi, well, you know, I sometimes think of it as a vegetarian language, she said, which I thought was, you know, delightful. So what she was talking about was that the language she wanted to use had to be a robust hybrid of, you know, with uh, languages, with multiple influences. Now, what do you do about all these aspirations when you are unfortunately, unfortunate enough to be writing about India? and about Indians in English. So the kind of multidimensional, simultaneous and invisible translation that takes place. Um, I'm going to pick on one particular book uh, of mine where I honestly uh, grappled with this problem quite self-consciously. And this was my most recent novel, I Have Become the Tide, um, which has just been um, translated into Kannada and hopefully will soon be out in Tamil. Uh, uh, somebody as fine uh, tra uh, translators, Mangai is translating it. Now, what were some of my dilemmas as I wrote I Have Become the Tide, where you have three strands of stories. The first strand goes way back into the past, sometime between the 9th and 12th centuries. And this young man whose father was a cattle skinner um, runs away after his father dies, is uh, uh, bumps into uh, uh, you know, practitioners of, of a sort of bhakti movement where they are trying to uh, set up uh, a, a casteless, uh, gender equal um, uh, uh, society, a small group called Anandagrama, which is, of course, very uh, reminiscent of many of the uh, Bhakti movement attempts at uh, creating uh, something of a utopia, certainly a more just society. So that is there in the first strand, how he becomes part of that. This, uh, the third strand is three young people. Uh, in today's India, trying to get admission for medical college uh, on the basis of reservation. So, uh, and one of their biggest problems, of course, is English. And one of the biggest sources of loneliness in, um, if you do get that uh, seat in medical college, is that you might actually be in the same room with somebody who's a, a, a quota student from the north. So speaks only Hindi and you speak only Kannada, for example. And so there is 
not only the loneliness of the, you know, the institutional discrimination against you because you are a quota student, uh, but also the loneliness of, of language um, and the loneliness that you might have created by a casteist professor. And will that uh, be uh, remedied by uh, an Ambedkarite professor, for example? So now, and as a bridge, the second uh, strand is um, a teacher, an intellectual who wants to translate some of the poems that that 9th to 12th century person wrote for today. And because he uh, says that this poet, she was Dalit, uh, but he's claimed by the Hindu orthodoxy, so he gets into trouble. OK, uh, I don't know if, I, if the the um, plot makes any sense. It's a fairly complex novel, hopefully written simply. But the, what were some of my dilemmas? How was I going to write a poetry? Of course, that's that's always a problem for a prose writer. But there were enough models uh, of uh, translators like Ramanjan who translated the Vachanas so beautifully and which had a huge influence on me when I was a very young woman, uh, that through translation you could access, uh, and it doesn't really matter whether it's literally uh, loyal to the original. You don't even worry about that. All of us have grown up reading uh, masterpieces from various, say, European languages, and we've not asked, is it loyal to the original? But we've still gained a lot of riches from what we read, you see? So you take it as a matter of trust, and which is, I suppose, what I did as a as, as a growing girl, uh, reading these vachanas. So one was, how was I going to delve into the past? How was I going to imagine this language in which I don't write? Perhaps a mixture of Kannada and Marathi. And how was I going to take into account not only his class, but caste and in the past? So there were uh, great demands being made on the imagination that, uh, and my choice was to pick an object in nature because I was, uh, I decided that my narrative strategy would be that um, I would show the ideology of this group through their livelihood, that their link with nature, their connection with nature was through work, not as, uh, as admiration in aesthetic terms, but through work, which would actually reflect their ideology as well. So um, that that uh, beauty and meaning in life is is found through the kind of work you have to do, and every work that is done uh, is uh, redolent with dignity. That all work is is equal. So in his case, I picked on the river because it flows. So there's movement. So it's not stagnant. So there is no authority. It keeps flowing. So, uh, and using the, both the literal description of the river and the, uh, the metaphor of the river, I decided that I would write things that were as simple as possible, that he's speaking to the river who is his friend. So this was one kind of, um, you know, uh, process of invisible translation, what you're doing there is you're simulating a kind of let's pretend situation. Usually when you're writing fiction, in any case you are saying that age old um, uh, practice that begins in childhood, let's pretend, you know, and, and, and of course this is a process not only of understanding the other, let me pretend I'm you. Let me pretend I'm this man in the ninth century because that is the only way I can not only imagine what it might like to be you, but I will understand by extension who I am. You know, um, so so that that is a kind of uh, let's pretend situation. But what are you doing? 
you're not just imagining that language. What you are imagining is that sensibility, that viewpoint. So getting under somebody else's skin is not just a matter of words. It's a matter of an entire worldview. And which is, of course, finally, the tremendous value, not only of the translation process, also of reading and writing, indeed of speaking to each other. All communication is pointless unless we translate sensibility. So I think, you know, that that is that is what, of course, um, I, I found. And similarly, uh, when I'm writing about these three young students and their difficulty with English. Now, that calls not only for a writer's imagination, but it also calls for a citizen's concern. Because as a writer, not only do I have the responsibility to try to the best of my abilities without having had those experiences, without appropriating their experiences to imagine. But also as a as a citizen. As I'm imagining. To bring in my the political, which is my solidarity. With the situation that though we have a constitution which promises equality, all these what 75 years later that we still have a situation where these young people our future feel discriminated against or have difficulty with the language in which they are taught the language in which they are mocked and the language in which they are intimidated and sometimes defeated not always but sometimes so what would their poetry be? There's a young uh, Dalit medical student called Satya in my book. Who writes poetry? And I think this is very important. At one point he tells his friend, I don't even know what I write is poetry. And the friend tells him, who's anyone to tell you how poetry should be written? If you think it's your poetry, it is. And in a way, I think these are some troubling questions we have to address. Those of us who write correctly, who teach, um, you know, are we are we making a mistake? Are we do we have to be a little loser about the the uh, rules of um, what is correct writing? What is correct translation? I. In other words, I think that all the time we have to ask ourselves one rather tricky question. Can you leap from being a translator to a writer? Can you leap from being a writer to a citizen? Because without that, we will continue to be restricted, dominated, and hemmed in by the power structures within uh, language and what how translation is done from which language to which language and in what particular register. So again, I want to. Uh, to. To tie it all up. By again going back to AK Ramanujan and uh, uh, Vinay Darbarkar's essay on um, A.K. Ramanujan's theory and practice of translation. Ramanujan, of course, quite instinctively breaks some of these power structures by saying even one's own tradition is not one's birthright. It has to be earned, repossessed. The old bards earned it by apprenticing apprenticing themselves to the masters. One chooses and translates a part of one's past to make it present to oneself and maybe to others. One comes face to face with it sometimes in far away places as I did. So in a way this enlarges the canvas 
of translation or it, it brings in uh, uh, the powerful weapon of imagination. So that rules are followed. The text, of course, is, is the big boss. But you have the, uh, the tool of imagination uh, to, to not just translate in a literal way, but to make that work sing in the target language. Uh, Darvatka adds, at the most general level of effort then, the translator is engaged in carrying over not only texts, but also readers, cultures, traditions, and himself or herself in radically metamorphic ways. So just like writing, which is why I feel entitled to speak about translation, it evolves into an open-ended, multi-track process in which translator, author, poem, and reader move back and forth between two different sets of languages, cultures, historical situations, and traditions. In a fluid process of this sort, some people, of course, they use the label intertextuality, the translations that succeed best are those capable of making the most imaginative connections between widely separated people, places, and times. Uh, that is um, what we writers struggle to do. And I do think that the translator is very much on par with the writer in this imaginative process. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much. We've been receiving a lot of comments. Um, thank you. I will uh, now move on to the questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions already here, uh, but uh, if somebody would like to ask her questions, uh, you may please raise your hands uh, and please make your questions very, very brief. Don't speak in paragraphs, just questions, please. <laughs> Ma'am, it was amazing. Yeah, please raise your hand if somebody wants to ask the question directly. Debayan, would you like to ask the question or should I ask it on behalf of you? Chance to interact. OK, ma'am, I'll read out the question that is asked by Debayan Nag. If translation is multidimensional, doesn't it also involve translating multiplicity of emotions, bridging cultural feelings of self, other besides language diversity? Self or other besides language diversity? Should I repeat? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm going to unravel that question as best as I can. Okay. Uh, you know, when when you translate, you're doing exactly what you do when you um, communicate in any other way, whether you are writing or reading. Now, here we are all talking to each other. Here is an example of um, uh, diversity that we are quickly uh, translating to make sense of. You know, we all speak uh, different sorts of Englishes. We use words differently. There are different sensibilities um, which we are bringing uh, to this platform. So it's almost impossible uh, in many parts of the world, but certainly in India, to either write or read or translate or indeed, you know, walk the streets without uh, either visible or invisible translation of diversity. So that that is uh, the the kind of day to day communication we have, as well as the more self conscious kind of communication we have in whether in the classroom or through a text. All right, uh, OK, ma'am. Next question is from Jennifer. She asks, uh, ma'am, mm -hmm. what do you think is the significance of positions such as other exteriority and hybridity in writing the world? Are these positions inevitable to write a perceptive world? Gosh, what a bunch of philosophical uh, 
<laughs> um, I, uh, just, just repeat the question for me, uh, Kartika. Like, yes. Uh, what do you think is the significance of positions such as other, exteriority and hybridity in writing the world? Are these positions inevitable to write a perceptive world? You know, uh, we must never mix up the the perceptive quality of the work, the insightful, valuable nature of the work with where you come from. Um, uh, I've often said uh, it's not a very popular uh, comment uh, usually, but you know, if I have students, I've often said that the fact that you come from either a hybrid place or a troubled place, the fact that you have um, stories of your own, uh, stories that you have experienced and been part of that are complex and um, uh, troubling, does not mean that what you write there or what you translate from there will necessarily be um, of a certain quality of literature. So uh, it might be very useful sociologically. It might be very useful as a political statement, but uh, literature has this very annoying way of um, having certain independent indices um, of quality. So the, the ideal position would be that you are able to communicate a certain worldview, um, a certain ideology, if you like, your writerly ideology of your take on the um, power structures and how they affect these particular human beings in this particular situation you're writing about or that you're translating. So if you're able to marry that uh, perspective, the uh, worldview with certain narrative strategies. The two are so completely welded together that you can barely separate them, except a, in, a, in a pretend way in the classroom. Now that would be good literature. But that's a theoretical formulation and we spend our whole lives um, aspiring to that. And uh, the fact that you don't succeed once doesn't mean that you're not going to try again. And in fact, uh, when you come to the business of translation, uh, there is no such thing as the final translation, however good it is. So uh, it's almost like a compliment to the text that various people will keep trying to translate it. And sometimes uh, there is even the very, very rich uh, experience you get when you read multiple translations of a text, say Mahashweta Devi's or, or Adaya Pawar's Baluta, which has been translated by different people. So you look at these various translations and you get some, you know, a, a, a closer view of what the original text might be. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so no raised hand, so I assume that I have the control of the session, so I'm just going to the next question. All my but, answers are so convoluted that they don't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am, there are so many great comments coming in, and I'm I'm really wondering why people are not raising hands to react, you know, to interact. <laughs> yes, somebody has raised hands. Is it a forced hand raise? Najib K. Sultan, you may please ask the question. Let me just uh, uh, enable. Yeah, I think you can speak now. Can't you? Najib. No. OK, one second, I'll make you a presenter. There you go. Can you speak now and mute and speak? Dr. Najib. I think he has some technical difficulty, ma'am. Um, let him sort it out. Yeah. I'll move to the next. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. Is it audible, ma'am? Very clear. Yes. Go ahead. Please. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to uh, uh, talk with uh, uh, Geeta, ma'am. And uh, yeah, my question is, uh, how you face criticism when it comes to uh, your uh, open forum? Like uh, there are a lot of uh, intricacies and complexities involved in translation studies. So 
is there any techniques to be followed when you are uh, dealing with all these critiques and uh, uh, people who are just throwing um, the, their their uh, open uh, statements uh, and uh, in that situation how you how you take those criticism uh, ma'am this is my question thank you so much i'm going to um, it, there's some uh, something of the unsaid in your question and i'm going to try and imagine what they may, uh, that might be one is of course to begin with uh, uh, what you choose to translate you know um uh, that's almost as uh telling uh of 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 your concerns as what you choose to write uh because uh you can't write about something which doesn't puzzle you uh where uh, you don't have a question you know um you don't write a, a text because you have answers you're you're writing because um, you want to grapple with a question you know why does it happen like this why do people relate like this to each other why do people hate people they don't even know that might be a question that you're grappling with okay so similarly uh you choose a text to translate because that text has spoken to you in a particular way it has either uh, made you uncomfortable and it has raised certain questions within you or it has for that brief moment it has um, kind of raised a curtain and you've looked at the world uh, uh, for that glimmer of a moment in a clearer way and you want to share that you want to say here uh, uh, let me share this text with you in a language that you can read because uh it it asks this troubling question which i think um that both you and i should address you see um and uh, uh this is this is also a way of saying let me put it this way you know you have somebody say from punjab coming to your house and you say you know i have i've i i enjoyed your laboratory you know um and your lassi but you know will you eat my masal dosa and my badam halwa you know it's it's so sometimes it is a sharing of uh, this is why i use the word sensibility the sharing of a particular subculture that you are on intimate terms with you're not always best friends with it there are things in it that you find to criticize but there is a very good um reflection on it that you want to share so that is yet another possibility now what do you do with a critique of what you've chosen to translate you know that is not a, a critique that you will pay any attention to i think because you have interacted with it it's moved you um it's troubled you and you have chosen that so if people tell you why did you choose this to translate i think you should ignore them okay then to go beyond that uh techniques of translation pretty much like criticism of of writing in the sense that there's no point if somebody tells you you should have written it like this and like this and like this so well that person is free to go and write his or own own text on the matter or translate uh, that same text in a different way so criticism for it to be constructive and of course criticism should always be welcome because uh, it enriches your experience of translation it uh, adds a conversation to uh, that particular uh, encounter that translation has uh, generated among the text the translator and the reader mm? so constructive criticism should be in terms of two things one is craft you know is this word really a good equivalent for that and that is always there's always room for conversation uh, there you know uh, let me give you a specific uh, specific example uh in these poems that I was talking about earlier that I wrote for my novel I have become the tide I wanted 
this uh, young man to address the river uh, on, on an equal footing. So I did not want my God or my Lord. Uh, the word I wanted to use, uh, there was a Tamil word floating in my head, Tunaivan. So Tunaivan as in companion, but companion it, it doesn't really work uh, the same way in English. So finally, I had to settle for friend. A friend is also a good word, but to me, because of my, uh, because of other languages pouring into my ears, because of our multilingual context, it did not seem as precise as Tonaiba. So you are going to have discussion and debate about this kind of carpentry aspect, the craft aspect of translation. The other aspect of translation is also the, the, the perspective you bring to it. You know, now what do I mean by that? If you choose, for example, I will not use local example, so I don't get into more trouble. Um, if you choose, for example, to translate um, Hitler's Mein Kampf, what, because every text you are involved in, whether you're writing it or translating, you take a particular stand, you take a certain location. Hmm? Ideally, you would choose not to translate Mein Kampf, but if you did for a, an, as an academic exercise, because we must read both benign as well as malignant texts. So we know, uh, so knowledge is important um, of, of all sorts of things in the world. So we know how to recognize the malignant as well. But are you going to translate it in a way that your perspective on the text also comes through? Or are you going to be, you know, neutral? Are you going to communicate a sense of neutrality? So there, there might be room for criticism, for debate. So I don't know if I have uh, answered in a very complex way, but all of you are asking very, very complex questions. So which is why I have to uh, reply in the circuitous fashion. Thank you very much, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, Aditya asked one question. If we translate sensibility, we may not adhere to the boundary of what is translation technically. Mm -hmm. If we do so, we may not produce a translation, but another text. How do you define translation here? And how do you differentiate this translation from the original writing? Yeah, as I said, the original text is the boss. But uh, in life, especially when you are trying to do something imaginative, something creative, and indeed translation is also a creative exercise, um, you are you have to know the rules to to bend the rules imaginatively, to experiment with bending the rules and denting the rules, and sometimes maybe even breaking a rule or two. You have to know the rules. Uh, so you can't you can't work in a vacuum. So what you call the technical is is training yourself um, uh, to to write or translate or indeed read. Uh, knowing the rules, uh, learning more and more. It's a lifelong process. You're not going to you know finish a BA or an MA or a PhD and say now you know everything about the technique. It's it's something you learn afresh with each. Uh, encounter with the process with each text that you work on. So you do need to know your uh, your the, the technical aspects, uh, practice it and, uh, you know, go through it, learn more and more about it. Uh, and not just in a classroom situation. Who are our real teachers? Uh, throughout our lives, uh, you know, when you are finding difficulty in 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 a particular uh, uh, at a particular point with something technical when you're writing or when you are translating, you have your bookshelf. You have the texts that people have written and translated. So if you don't have the great comfort of, of um, teachers and resource persons as you will uh, uh, in over the next few days, 
what you do is take down a book and say, so you have teachers who you will need never meet. You have translators who will teach you if you look at it and say, OK, OK, I could do this or I could do this and you make the choice. And you make that choice uh, of solving that problem, and it is on that basis to go back to the earlier question that you can actually um, uh, be criticized or appreciated. In short, be invited to engage in a debate. So. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Umesh Kumar asked a personal question. If ma'am wishes to answer, do you remain a single person while juggling across multiple languages? In other words, do you see different use? I mean, you uh, of yourself in multiple languages. So it's, it's a seriously intelligent question. Um, uh, and 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 I think that you know this is uh, we're going into the realm of uh, you know I'm no scientist and I don't know how the brain functions with the multiple languages, but um, you know of course that uh, uh, in moments of danger, you know suppose you're sitting in a plane and it's there's turbulence, ah, uh, and you go into autopilot. You know, and whether you uh, usually pray or not, whether you are a believer or an atheist, there's certain, you know, uh, words which go through your mind. Uh, now, what language is that in? Or better still, when you uh, see a lovely uh, uh, little baby uh, or you see a very cute puppy on the road, what language uh, do you talk to it, you know, what language do you use when you're talking nonsense? You know, baby talk. Uh, you will find very often that that is literally the mother tongue. You know, many of us have a father tongue and a mother tongue, you know, but that tends to be the mother tongue. So the language of emotion, and I know this is a cliche, but it's true. You, um, I think, uh, but to answer your question, Specifically, I think your multiple identities and all of us have multiple identities. Uh, those multiple identities, of course, are expressed in very different um, languages, dialects, in-group languages, more formal language and so on. You're absolutely right. I think uh, it also reflects your degree of competence in the language. So uh, when I want to say something very serious, uh, when I want to make a political statement, I would prefer to do it in a language where I'm careful, where I can be careful about nuance. You see, so uh, I've just got back from Bangalore where I was talking about the Kannada translation of my novel, and uh, I have some working knowledge of Kannada, meaning I can uh, certainly go marketing and I can get an auto and so forth. But it's it's um, I wouldn't trust it to make a, a fine political point or a fine literary point. So then I come across as a, a simpler person. So, you know, you have all these different identities, uh, linguistic, gender, class, um, uh, community, as well as not only where you come from, but what you have rejected from where mm -hmm. you've come from and what you as an adult have ascribed to yourself. So these are the multiple identities. Excellent, ma'am. Thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, Rishav Dutta asked, uh, the commonly understood senses of translation in India are rupantar, that is change in form, anuvad, speaking after, vivartanam, transformation, and so on. And neither of these terms demands fidelity to the original. In Indian consciousness, don't you think translation has always been deemed as a creative act, a new writing? Absolutely. You know, this is um, uh, always this is always uh, uh, I spoke when I read I spoke of happy and unhappy accidents. Now, uh, not being loyal to the text is exactly like learning the rules and then bending them. So, uh, you know, uh, you will know you will know when you read uh, uh, a translated text which may be very loyal but it does not sound natural. You know, we have to trust the year. I think 
one of the ways in which your written text proves itself to you as I'm not going to use the word authentic because we know that in these times that uh, word is fraught with danger, but it has to sound right. It has to sound true. So what may sound true in one language does not necessarily sound true in another. So we are not talking about Google Translate because there are human beings with with uh, brains and imagination um, involved here. So the experience you have of reading the uh, text in the original, you want to say here. Let me let me let me sing this. So the. Ragam is the same. Uh, the. Uh, what your your touch there, what you see is also present So the translator. Yes, the translator's ego has to be kept in firm control, but the translator is not 100% invisible in the text. You know, so that is why I say that the translation is the translator's gift because you're there, you're there, you're imagining it too, but in a very, you know, the translator's nature is modest. So you are backstage, but your efforts are definitely there. So finally, how far can you deviate from the text? How far can you carry your um, imaginative uh, exercise is something that has to be guided a by your inner ear. B, it is open to discussion and debate as indeed Ramanujan's Vachana translations. Um, they are uh, uh, they're beautiful, but they have been the source of much discussion about whether they depart too far from the original in their attempts to actually remain poetry. So this is these are not um, which is of course the exciting thing about literature, about texts that it's open to endless debate. There is no authority that can tell you this is what you need to do. You need to do it and learn what works for you and for the text. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you very much. Would you be able to take a few more questions, ma'am? There are two more Certainly. questions. Certainly. Certainly. <laughs> OK, but there is a question about uh, the idea of purity and impurity in the production of translation, and he says that uh, Dr. Sudhagar he posed this question because um, somewhere in the talk uh, there was a mentioning about Bambaya as impure Bhasha. Uh, if further, I mean, it further creates more confusion when it was said that the shift in language uh, we went uh, shift in subculture and culture. So shift in language equates uh, shift in subculture and culture. So don't you think Bambia, Bambaya language also belongs to people and their subculture and culture? It's Absolutely. In yeah. fact, uh, I think you misunderstood me. I am all for. Uh, see, we have to address even if we don't agree and I do not, uh, you know, uh, Purity is a very difficult notion for me. It, it is almost always accompanied in history and definitely in our, con in our uh, country with uh, excluding people on the basis of purity, uh, whether it is um, of caste, which is the first thing that comes to mind, or language or food or, you know, so. Uh, I actually am saying that language is one. One resource we possess that teaches us very powerfully that. We can communicate better, we can communicate in richer ways if we entirely shed this notion of purity because languages flow into each other. Just as people have multiple identities, just as we are all kind of hybrid uh, products who come together. I mean, just this whole experiment called India, you know, uh, here we are 
extraordinarily diverse. But with this additional identity of being Indian that we are constructing on a daily basis, well, how, how can we do that if we attach pure to any noun, whether it is a human being, whether it is a language, whether it is a cuisine, um, it's impossible. It's impossible. So impurity is a much maligned word, and I suppose it would be more polite to talk of it in, in neutral terms such as hybridity or diversity. But we are really talking about impurity as in extraordinarily rich combinations, extraordinarily rich overlaps, and sometimes transformations. So we need to talk about it because we are saying that these are our terms of engagement with language, with the multilingual situation, with the literary exercise, the reading exercise, and therefore the translation exercise. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. K. Krishnamurthy, would you like to speak to her? Please turn on your mic. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, madam. It is a pleasure to talk with you. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. you are very, yes, very, very audible. Yeah. Uh, some of your novels have been translated. Agreed. Yes. And uh, uh, whether the, all your emotions have been translated perfectly, and uh, how will you react to the situation if it is not translated perfectly? Question number one. Question. Okay. Shall I respond to that? Yes. Um, yeah. Well. It's entirely, I'm smiling because it's entirely a matter of trust. Um, you know, if uh, at the most I can, I can get a sense of the Tamil translation, uh, uh, which I could read very slowly and painfully. Uh, I can't read uh, and, uh, any of the uh, other languages that uh, my work has been translated into. Uh, I remember that when uh, In Times of Siege was translated into Urdu in um, uh, Pakistan, I decided to write a, a preface because uh, uh, just as I uh, didn't want, I don't want any of my texts to be misused by the right wing in India. I didn't want uh, my text to be uh, misused uh, in other uh, uh, locations. Uh, uh, the right wing or the conservatives anywhere. So those are some of the uh, uh, attempts at protecting yourself and your text that you uh, that you attempt. But um, honestly, you have no idea. You trust the translator. You trust that publisher. Uh, how would I know whether they have uh, done full justice to my, uh, you know, book in Vietnamese or, <laughs> or, or even French or uh, German. So essentially that is a matter of trust. And, you know, once you have written a text or translated a text, you, in a way that uh, text goes out into the world. Um, and just as you let your children go um, uh, and sit on the sidelines and, you know, your heart aches a little about their um, uh, adventures and misadventures. That's what happens with the text as well. Um, once you have it's uh, published, you have really let it go and um, it leads, uh, it acquires a life of its own. Great, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, Thank, you I very think... much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, ma'am, uh, there is one question. Can we translate an author's voice keeping in mind the socio cultural context? How do we do that? Author's voice. Uh, of course, I mean, you know, the the text is uh, it, it's impossible to separate the text from the author's voice. That's what it is. The um, uh, it's the voice, uh, the author's voice speaking to you. But there is also a larger context. Now, when you translate um, uh, a text which is very specifically located in a community um, or in certain times. Uh, 
you need to frame that translation. You know, uh, you need to say that um, this, uh, uh, for example, I just recently read um, the uh, translation um, called uh, of, of Gabbilam. I think I have it somewhere here, but um, and this is by Chinnaya Jangam from Telugu. So it is of a particular time. I think it's in um, the early 20th century, if I'm not mistaken. And now you need to be told that a Gabbilam is a bat and that it's a writing back to um, uh, make Duta because instead of swans and peacocks, uh, you have this um, very powerful uh, Telugu poet uh, uh, from the Dalit community writing and saying, let me talk to the bat hanging upside down because this is what my position is like in this society. And being told some of these, uh, uh, the details of the context, both in terms of time that he was very much part of uh, the freedom struggle because so much of uh, uh, on the basis of caste people who were part of the freedom struggle have been uh, rendered invisible over a period of time in our formal narratives. So knowing some of these contexts uh, historically uh, in terms of, of uh, position in society, which always almost means caste in India. This is very important because that helps you to experience the text better. So very often the framing of the translation becomes very important. Indeed, even being told that these were the difficulties in translation, uh, uh, this is what happens in the original. Uh, it actually helps you, those annotations help you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, there are a couple of more questions. I think I can send it to you and uh, you can respond it uh, over the email. I'll share it with them. Is that fine? Shall yeah. we take one more so that? Yeah. Uh, uh, OK. Certainly. Uh, ma'am, uh, this question goes like this. Reina Singh has asked, ma'am, you spoke about the struggle of a Dalit student who tried to grapple with English as a language. Those on the margins have less access to learn English, but at the same time, those discriminatory experiences that make English less accessible are also very much rooted in those regional languages. In Ambedkarit circles, English is often perceived and used as a language that empowers. What's your take on this question of empowering nature of English versus the lack of accessibility to learn it? I, um, I can only uh, remember that I'm making this comment as an outsider. Uh, but I can see that because all our languages are marked, just as all our languages are marked by uh, gender unequal connotations, by sexist connotations, by misogynistic connotations. Similarly, all our languages, all our Indian languages have a strong Castist um, uh, component that many of us who come from privileged backgrounds only even begin to understand as adults. Uh, I'm not saying that we have understood it uh, uh, fully by any means. So the uh, uh, the subtext of language as well as the open, overt, uh, discriminatory uh, component of our languages inevitably mean that uh, English is, as an outsider is seen as caste free. Of course, we know that in, in our day to day experience that in terms of access to English uh, and it's definitely in terms of access to a particular quality of English, that it is class based. So. Uh, this is why when we're talking about structures of power, we have to look at multiple axes, of course. Um, caste invariably comes up because it's perhaps uh, the oldest and the most awful and unique 
invention of division and discrimination uh, in our part of the world. So, but you have to look at these multiple axes to try and understand the complexities of our situation. Um, caste, definitely class and community, particularly in these times. Um, so various religious communities, uh, geographical locations, and of course, the Adivasi communities. So uh, it is it is a very complex situation and which is why, of course, uh, politics or understanding uh, structures of power, whether um, uh, in education, in language, in literature, um, access to uh, all these riches that everyone should have access to is so difficult. But that does not mean we stop uh, grappling with it because no, there is no other way to, to move towards our aspiration to equality. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was a really brilliant session. I don't have any adjectives to describe it and uh, I won't be audacious to even attempt any. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much from the depth of my heart. And I, I thank am, you. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much, ma'am. Before you leave, uh, participants, can we have a group picture with her? Please turn on your cameras and uh, Anila, Humaira, Anjana, Maitri, Anisha, Aishriya, please click. Yeah, everybody. And I, must, I must I must thank all the participants for such good searching questions. And all I can say is keep asking them. Great, ma'am. <laughs> thank you very much. Ma'am, uh, I think we can't see you uh, for a moment. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank all of you. you. Thank you, Kartika. Thank you, Thank you very much, ma'am. Oh. I'll contact you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.